Hello everyone, today is Thursday, December 8, 2016, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Looks like we have pretty good attendance today, so that's exciting. All right, what do we talk about? Well, the Trump rally continues, if you want to call it that. We don't have to call it that. I just want to make a quick follow-up on some of the things I've been saying recently on that. And then, obviously, when we get to the charts, we'll flesh out a lot of this. And the exciting thing is a lot of new areas are joining in the fray. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but at first it was just uh, these brick-and-mortar stocks because, you know, if you could build a wall, you could need a lot of bricks and mortar. But now, all of a sudden, it's like everything is just kind of piling on or dog piling on. So I find that kind of interesting. Also, as usual, we'll talk about uh, whatever questions you have on trading. Um, if you don't mind, hold off or, or, or um, how do I say this? You can ask any question you want as far as trading is concerned. But when we wait until we get to the charts before you ask about individual stocks. And when you do, if you don't mind, just ask about one stock. At a time. This week we're going to talk about why take partial profits, and I want to talk a little bit about exercising discretion. Even though in this particular case it worked out, I promise you it won't always work out. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often say, all predictions about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Okay, um, just a quick follow-up because we've been talking about this for a few weeks, but the question is, will stop Trump? Blah, let's start over. Will Trump be good for stocks? And this is the thing that I've been saying lately is you got to be really careful with big picture ideas. Logically, they can make a whole lot of sense. But because I, I think back to um, I want to say when Obama first got in, this, it would have been like an anti-coal president. I think we did OK in some coal stocks way back then. And last week, I used the example of uh, Obama was anti-guns for eight years and the gun stocks went up 800 percent. So markets can often be illogical. So be careful to try to interject logic in anything when it comes to the markets. And it's kind of easy to become uh, passionate and attached to ideas. So you have to be really careful not to do that. And reality often doesn't unfold as planned. So those are just some thoughts I talked about last few weeks. No need to flesh them out this week. I just want to let people in, let people know that weren't here last couple of weeks. So go back and watch those YouTubes on those, and uh, I flesh it out in a lot more detail. So this week I want to talk about applying a little discretion to help improve performance. And we had one recently that got really, really close to initial profit target and then began to sell off fairly hard. Now, fortunately, it came back up and hit that initial profit target, but I can assure you that that won't always happen. So let's take a look at that. So on this particular stock, we had an entry of 920. And this will all play out in animation in just one second. But we had an entry, I'm sorry, an entry of 770 and an initial profit target of 920. So let's take a look at that. So there's the entry. Now, of course, we could always be wrong. And, and I, more than anyone out there that I know, talks more about money management than, than anyone I know out there. Because you could always be wrong, obviously. I'd probably make a lot more money in my educational business if I just talked about how exciting everything always is and not so much about money management. But hey, you know what? I'd rather have you guys for a long time as opposed to um, one and done. So here we have the initial profit target. And this was close, but no cigar. It came within two cents of the initial profit target right there. And the stock then sold off fairly hard, as you can see. And it became questionable whether or not this position was actually going to work altogether. And then it went right back up and it tagged that target yesterday. So it has been officially hit. Now, one thing I can guarantee, they won't always do this, okay? So you have to be willing to take partial profits when they get close, fairly close to the profit target. In this particular case, now sometimes it's tough if you, if you um, and I recommend you don't watch a screen. First of all, as I said, if you have a day job, sometimes it's tough. But I recommend you don't watch a screen anyway. And I try not to watch a screen too much. I just try to set alarms. And I know it's hard not to watch a screen if you're in front of it. 
but I try to just keep myself incredibly busy, which is something I talk about quite often. So I won't go there uh, today. But set an alarm or something so you know that you're getting fairly close to that official uh, profit target. And then you could use a little discretion. In this particular case, it was kind of cool because it actually closed fairly close to that profit target. So it wasn't like it sprung up and then came right back in. And that was the point I was trying to make. If you're busy doing some other things, that maybe you would you would miss this uh, this spike, but hopefully, if you are busy doing other things, you would just simply set an alarm, maybe somewhere in here, or check in once or twice a day to see where it is, to know whether or not you need to take action. And if you think you might be getting close to take take the to taking action, then then maybe you set an alarm uh, somewhere, maybe around nine or so, to trigger and let you know that it's time to take some action. So let's break some of this down. The question is, how do you know when to apply a little discretion? And by the way, uh, I did a video. I think it's on my home page. If not, uh, it shouldn't be too far. If you go into um, recent commentaries. So, oh, is there a problem with the stop and veil? Okay, well, if it seems wrong, then it is. Uh, it should be wherever the entry was. Yeah, it should be right. The stop is 770 because that was the original entry point. Remember, what we're doing is we're we're getting in, we're taking initial profits, and then we're bumping that stop up to break even. Okay, Phil? So it should be okay uh, at that level. Now, I know... Um, I, I hear what you might be saying, though. It might be kind of close to the market. That's just because of the territory. And hopefully we move out of that swing trade mode into the longer-term trend-following mode, which I'm going to talk about in just a few seconds. So you get away from that stop that's too close, okay? And I'll flesh that out in one second. But the questions you have to ask yourself – oh, by the way, so again, before I forget – Discretion is doing a few things to improve the performance of the system. And basically, you're using the brain and your head to improve the performance through minor tweaks to the system. So if you're two cents within a profit target, if the stock is at 918, and let's say even if it closes at 910, okay, close enough to the profit target. Now, um, it's funny, I've been asked before, like it closed, it, uh, the high on this day was 918 and the profit target was 920. And people will ask me things like, hey, Dave, how come you just don't set your stop at, I mean, your initial profit target at 918? It's like, nobody's that good, okay? If I could get it down to the penny, then you'd probably never see my fat ass again, okay? Markets are imperfect. You're dealing with a lot of other people, okay? The emotions of all these other people. And through technical analysis, we're reading the emotions of all this, these other people while at the same time embracing our own because we, we're one of these participants. So nobody can get it down that good. And if somebody says they can, then, then they would own the world, and obviously they, they, uh, they would go off and be really quiet about it. Okay, But the fact is nobody knows exactly what a, mar a market's going to do. But that's liberating. That's liberating. It means that, that small traders can, can actually do – quite well and sometimes and in some cases we could be more nimble than the big boys and that's a wonderful thing now before I get digress too far I know too late you need to ask yourself if you're thinking about locking in a profit kind of early is how long have you been in the trade and how fast is the move if you have a move like this it just skyrockets really quickly okay like that that's in less than a one week that's about as good as it gets when you get a Initial profit target nearly hit over or less than a week or over a few days even. That's a pretty good deal. And you need to really think about taking that profit a tiny bit early if it's really, really close like this especially because what happens? Well, that market has swung from overbought back up to oversold. And what's likely to happen next is likely to have a move back down towards oversold. And in this particular case, it actually did. Now, the fortunately of this one is it did rally back up, but I can assure you they won't always do that. So question number one is how fast was the move? Okay, so if it's just kind of meandering around and gradually goes up and it gradually goes up and it's getting fairly close and it's not like super duper close, like two cents, 
then it's okay to maybe sit on your hands a little bit and not worry so much about it. Now remember, we're trying to get 1% at least on that first loaf, on that first half of the trade. I used to work with a hedge fund guy. He always called it a loaf. That's why I'm always calling it a loaf for whatever reason. But uh, Or your first half loaf of the trade, or first loaf of the trade. So if you're up within a few cents, then you're almost at $1,000. And remember, this is not the ultimate goal. This, as we'll see in just one second, uh, it just kind of keeps you in the game and gives you that instant uh, gratification sometimes in a case like this where it feels really quick or gets there really quick. So, again, one week is about as good as it gets. Uh, how close is it to the initial profit target? Don't split hairs. Now, if you're looking for, let's say, five points and it goes up one point, then you're not anywhere near the initial profit target, okay? So, like, on a day like this day or this day, you weren't even near there. But on a day like this day where you're within two sets, okay, that's close enough. So you do want this number as close to 1% or $1,000 per 100K as possible. But if you're a little shy of that, then it's fine to take profits a little bit early. In fact, I would encourage you to actually do that in these particular cases when it gets really close and or it does it on a really fast manner or actually a combination of those two, I should say. So again, that was within two cents of the initial profit target. But here's a here's a question: Why should you take partial profits in the first place? Well, you're not going to get rich taking a partial profits. I remember I think it was like a couple of years ago. We just we would uh, we get into a trade, hit the partial profit target, come right back in. Easy for me to say. Let me slow down a little bit. We get into a trade, it would hit that initial partial profits, and then come right back in. So this is what our trading looked like. Get in here, get out, half here, and then stop out. Get in here. And this I think it was a beginning of the year a couple of years ago. Get out half, stop out. And we had quite a few of these, one after another after another. And the accuracy was through the roof, but we weren't making a lot of money. And that's why I'm often asked. I did a webinar for Italy, I think it was last week, and they asked me a lot of questions about accuracy. It's like, I'd rather have one or two big winners that look like this, it, all it takes is one, really, than to have a portfolio full of a bunch of winners that just barely get to the profit target and come right back in, okay? So you're not going to get rich off that initial swing trade, but here's the deal. It will keep you in the game when that's all the market offers. Like I said, a couple of years back, I remember, I have to look at the portfolio uh, records to see when it was, but it just seemed like we get into a position, it's like, yay. And, you know, clients were excited at first. It was like, hey, Dave, we got 100% winners. It's like, yeah, but none of them are really taking off for the longer term trend. But it does keep you in the game when that happens. And you do kind of chip away at it. And you do make a little money. And you only end up with 1% on the overall portfolio, which is better than a poke in the eye when you keep getting stopped out on the remainder. And longer term, it, yes, it is important that you do capture those occasional home runs. But it will keep you in the game when that's all the market offers. Now, it also allows for instant gratification and, and those of you who know me you could probably smell it here comes a little bit of that freshman psychology getting ready to rear its ugly head and you're right but we live in this microwave society where we want things to happen quickly an example I'll often give is when's the last time you seen a video store and I think we had one as I mentioned a few weeks back we had one in town closed down a couple of months ago and and I have no idea how they stayed open as long as they did. They were probably selling some crack or meth in the back of it or something. It was just some kind of bodega going on there. But anyway, I don't know if that's the right word, but I think bodegas is where you get your drugs in New York. Uh, not that I know that. I, I saw it in a movie once. Uh, I was in uh, Half-Baked. Anyway, before I digress too far, I get myself in trouble. It does allow for this instant gratification and we are, we do expect things instantly nowadays. We don't have time to drive to the video store. We want to push a button, get a peanut. We want to push a button, get a movie. We want, we don't have, we don't want to put our clothes on to go get a video. Okay, that's the society that we live in. Everything has to be right away. Amazon.com. I don't live in a big city. I live in the middle of freaking nowhere. But people who live in some of these big cities are telling me, man, they're like, this is the craziest thing. 
you could order something on on Amazon, and two hours later, it's at your front door. They're testing that out, and that's just that's Amazon's in tune with this. They know people want stuff right away. Now, what it does also do is it allows for a potential free position, and I'm trying to figure out a better way of describing this, but it's the best thing that I could describe. And I'm, a lot of times, I think about this is one of my shower thoughts. I know I'm pretty boring, but uh, <laughs> It's one of my shower thoughts. It's like if you could get into a trade and you get that partial profit out of the trade and you have your stop moved up to break even, okay, boring overnight gaps, you're in the money, okay, and the worst you could do is scratch out, as we said earlier, and make 1% on the trade. And the best you could do is a possible bigger picture, longer term home run. Um, who was it said? in one of the market wizards. It's, it's, it's on my website. I saw it a couple days ago, or saw it yesterday, in fact. It's, uh, dang it. Well, to paraphrase, basically it's saying controlling losses and occasional home runs is the secret to trading, and it is. It's, if you can keep your losses in check and have the occasional home run, you're going to do just fine. And I'll have to find that on the website, but it's it was a good quote from one of the Market Wizard guys. I think he was in New Market Wizards. And it's on the um, it's on the website somewhere if you do a search for it. Anyway, if you could position yourself with these free positions, and I, I think my shower thought was if there was some kind of way you can get in these free positions to where you could just stay with them forever, then you could have a, a good longer-term portfolio. But the trader in me is not going to take a drawdown of whatever it is, 50, 60, 70, 80% in some of these stocks uh, as they eventually do. Because somebody was asking me a couple days ago, like, you know, the stock's up, you know, a thousand percent since uh, whatever. And it's like, yeah, but it occasionally went down 50, 60 percent, 70 percent in between. And you didn't know if it was going to go to zero or not during those times. So you can't hold through it. So maybe that's just a fantasy of mine is, is to figure out a way to have these free positions in a long-term portfolio. But the good news is through the way I do this, you can at least ride out a longer-term trend via a trailing stop. And we'll take a look at the open portfolio in one minute and talk about that. And I see uh, James has a good question. I want to talk, I want to, I'll get to that in just one second, James. So it allows for the potential and for lack of a better word, free position, which can turn into home runs. And the good thing about these, these quote unquote free positions is, and again, it's another analogy. I, I don't know if I should use it or not, but for lack of a better analogy, at this point, once you've taken your money, money off the table, half your money, okay, and you have this open position, if you get stopped out, you're still going to make money on the remainder of it. So you're sort of playing with the market's money, so to speak. And this is one thing I often talk about is you have to be willing to give up some of those open gains at some point in time. Now, most people can't handle it. Uh, we'll be in a stock and we'll be trailing a stock, stop higher like this, and the market will end up like right here, and we're trailing it up, and then all of a sudden it sells off hard, stops us out. People email me pissed off. Oh, Dave, you know, up here uh, we could have made 200% and all we made was 150%. So, you know what I tell them? I know I'm beating a dead horse on this, but I tell them, hey, send me the money and then you forget about it. Keep enough out for a massage. Go get yourself centered and just forget about this whole trade and I'll take the money. Okay, P.O. Box 298, Abita Springs, Louisiana, 70420. I've yet to receive a check. Okay. Now, so it does allow these potential free positions, which could turn into home runs, thereby helping you fulfill your destiny. And this is both monetarily, and here comes that freshman psychology thing, and mentally. You know, that Maslow thingy? And here's that Maslow thingy, okay? Now, people often ask me, is my money management statistical or psychological? And the answer to that question is, yes, we're fulfilling that microwave society need for instant gratification, need to be right, and I hate to use the word hopefully, but hopefully fairly quickly, like an avail trade one week, close enough, okay? Sometimes it takes a little bit longer, but ideally on every trade, we want to get the timing perfectly to within a few days later, we're taking off a swing trade. Obviously, it doesn't always unfold like that. Sometimes it might take a month or longer to get that swing trade, the so-called swing trade, 
out. It's no longer a swing trade at that point from a, a pure textbook standpoint, but it's still a viable trade unless it's stopped out. And that's the dead money speech that I give over and over and over again, which I think I gave last couple of weeks. So go in and watch that too. So it does provide quite often that instant gratification. And then it also helps us to climb up that Maslow's hierarchy of needs where we're getting that longer term trend trade. So we're also right big over time. Now those are the psychological aspects of it. The statistical aspects are these trend trades and back, this was back in the day when I did a lot of mechanical testing, okay? These trend trades, and this is even if you're, this is if you're picking your markets good. If you're a mediocre stock picker or a mediocre market picker when it comes to futures or whatever it is you're trading, Forex or whatever, especially in those markets, it's going to be even less. But if you mediocre at best, it probably won't even be this high. But these trend trades are going to happen roughly about 28% of the time, if that much, okay, if that much, and that might be a little bit on the fat side. So more often than not, there's about a 70% chance or so that you will not get this longer term trend trade. So that's where the swing trade comes in. At least you're getting something off the table. And the idea is to chip away at it, chip away at it, chip away at it, chip away at it, bam, hit that big home run, or hopefully two or three. So it's statistical and it's also psychological. And remember, as we talked about last week and quite often, this is going to be a very tough way to trade if you're only trading for longer term trend trades. Because psychologically, you're going to be bummed out because most of the time you're going to be wrong. Psychologically, you're going to be bummed out because your stops are going to have to be, have to be so big, you're going to lose a lot of money when you're stopped out. And psychologically, once you're in one and you do catch a decent trend, your stop is still going to be so far away that you're going to give up a tremendous amount of open profits. But if we're making the transition from the short-term trader over to the swing trader, then your life becomes a little bit easier and you're ended up managing those open, pro open profits and you already got some profits off the table. So from a psychological standpoint, you're in a much better position and you're also in a much better position from a statistical one. All right, James says, you trade on the daily time frame. While the hourly makes a trader more exposed to random action, noise, would it also allow you to enter on shallow pullbacks and momentum stocks? The daily time frame for such stocks will not allow entries because pullbacks are insignificant. I'm interested in your observations. Okay, I have plenty of thoughts on that. Okay, first, first thought is, it seems like whenever we get into a rip-roaring trend, like we could have developing now, I get that question. Because you have these stocks that will just kind of make it like a little bear flag, if that, and then they'll just keep on going. And the question is, couldn't we just get in on an hourly? Well, you kind of answered your own question. An hourly is going to be a lot more noisy, okay? So that's the bottom line is it's just too noisy on an hourly chart. Wait until you get that nice TKO type of move, and it will happen. You just have to be patient. Even if some of these areas continue to go parabolic, you're going to see the mother of all TKO moves really soon, and that's what you really need to brush up on and think about now. Now, with that said, uh, I don't trade hourly charts in stocks. I just think it's far too noisy. The great thing about stocks is, as we'll take a look at this uh, portfolio in one second, you can capture these wildly wonderful, or crazy if you want to call them that, inefficient moves, okay? So you get into a little IPO like this, or you get into a commodity-related stock like this that's been beaten up for years and years and years, then you can have a huge inefficient move like we've seen so far, knock on wood and maybe this little IPO could take you higher. So if you get into these wildly inefficient stocks, you have the potential for a huge move. Now, if you're trading something like E-minis, okay, then by all means, take a look at that hourly chart and do something there, okay? Uh, in Forex, I just got stopped out of one this morning. I just got stopped out of Euro. Um, 
I think it was a euro. I, I, it's like I put on these positions. I have no idea what they are, and that's part of my evolution as a, as a trader. It's like I really don't care. I, like half the time, somebody's like, what does that stock do? It's like I have no idea. It's going up, you know? Somebody once said, uh, an Indian friend of mine, he said, uh, and this is how he actually talked. He's like, Dave, Dave would think if, if Dave thought that intravenous drug use was going up, he would buy needles. And I'm not quite that bad. I mean, intravenous drug use isn't going up, is it? But the point is you want to trade what's moving. You want to trade where the action is, where something's happening, okay? You don't want to get too caught up in, in the markets. Now, inefficient markets have the potential to make huge moves, whereas efficient markets such as Forex and E-minis and things where everybody and their brother is trying to trade, they're going to be a lot more efficient. Efficient means there's a lot of players, a crowded playing field. you got hedgers, speculators, um, you know, midnight tokers, smokers, chokers, midnight tokers, whatever. <laughs> you know, lovers, sinners, it's all these different people are, are fighting it out and indexers, and it's very hard for them to make any efficient moves. They can occur, but you have to pick your spots carefully. By pick your spots carefully, if you're trading something like Forex, I like to see the currency just hit a really major, 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 major low, and then maybe look to play an hourly bow tie off that major low, and sometimes that could turn into a nice... Uh, I go from hourly charts, I get a signal on the hourly chart, and sometimes my stop will be way down here at, uh, well, not way down here, but down towards the old lows. Let's see if we can get that back in there. So uh, the quick answer is, too late, I know. If, you're tra if you are trading something like Forex or something that's inefficient, if you wait for it to hit major lows and then you look, let's say this is the daily, if you wait for like an hourly bow tie, then you can maybe get in and have a stop right here at these old lows. So if, if it hits that, you know you're wrong. You always have to ask yourself, where would you be wrong in a trade? And be willing to accept that, put that stop actually in there, and then move on if you get stopped out. But what I like to do is I start off with that hourly chart, and once I get in the trade and it begins to work, then I change that chart over to a four-hour chart, okay? So and then if it keeps working, then I'll change it over to a daily chart, okay? And that way, if I'm watching a daily chart, you know, daily chart, you might see a little move like this, okay? And it's not that big of a deal. But if you're watching a five-minute chart, a little bar like this will look like that. And that will really stress you out. So the, the answer is, if you're trading an inefficient market, then by all means, I'm sorry, efficient market, such as Forex, e et etc., then by all means, take a look at those hourly bow ties or hourly first thrusts or whatever pattern you want to trade off of major highs and major lows because the most amount of people will be either on the wrong side of the market or have the wrong opinion about the market. And when that tide begins to turn up, in a case like this one, then all those people are going to have to put up or shut up, okay? So that's a long-winded way of saying it. But I think for stocks, I think you're better off just sticking with the daily chart. Your life is a lot easier, okay? And again, every time the market gets in a rip-roaring trend, it looks like it's never going to pull back again. I get that question. Why not just trade out the hourly? Now, there's nothing wrong with that. You're just going to, it's going to be a lot more noisier and you're going to be making a lot more trading decisions. And as I often preach, I think we're only wired to make so many trading decisions. I use the example of ER doctors and air traffic controllers. You don't find many that have been in a profession very long due to the, the constant decisions and constant stress of making those decisions. Now, this is something we talked a little bit about last week. So again, we're trying to, to go from trader over to trend follower. The other thing too, if you're trading stocks um, on an hourly basis, then something bad could still happen and you're not likely to get enough profits out for when it does. And that's the, that's the other caveat there. And that's why if you have a nicely wide or wider stop on a daily chart and you have all your risk adjusted accordingly, then you'll do much better. I, I went to this conference a few weeks back or a couple of months back. I spoke at uh, 
trade us for a cause. And a lot of those day traders, nothing against them. I mean, they're they're a lot of them are printing money, but they I asked all I, each one of them and asked, you know, did you ever put all your account into a trade? And they're like, yeah, all the time, you know. And they probably would do, uh, I forget what the leverage is. What's a day trade leverage now? Five times or whatever. So in some cases, five times the amount. And some of these guys have blown up uh, more than once, and they all told war stories about people that they knew that blew up. So you don't want to put yourself in that position. You have to, again, put yourself in a position for limited losses and potentially unlimited gains and not just the opposite. Anyway, long story endless, getting back to the portfolio. We're trying to make that position to transition from trader over to trend follower. Now, we don't know if that big trend is going to happen, so we take those partial profits out, and that's going to be half of the position for a 1% gain. So 2%, 100,000 account, we're risking 2,000 per trade. That's if stopped out. So we're looking for that 1% move on half, and then hopefully some big multiple there uh, of thereafter. So in this particular case, round numbers, 4000 6000 7000 uh, about eight or $9,000, whatever it is, out of 12000 you could see that that's like 75% uh, or 70% of the entire open portfolio is these big winning trades, and that's what makes your year, and that's what makes up your portfolio. And that's where the money is as a trend follower, and that's why we're here. We don't want to get in and make a bunch of trades we don't want to get in and trade the hourly or the five-minute chart on stocks, okay? If the market is efficient, as I said earlier, like E-minis or Forex or something like that, that's fine. Trading that much shorter-term time frame because the chance of that big trend happening is, is much less likely anyway. You're more likely to just capture a short-term move, if that. But the real money is in the longer-term trends, and the real money is in the longer-term moves. And that's why we're trying to position ourselves as a short-term trader who's willing to make that transition again over to the longer-term trader. Okay. Any questions on that? I know I kind of beat the dead horse on all these things. But as I said uh, recently, I'm going to keep saying the same stuff until you people get it. Not you people. You people are pretty good. But a lot of people, like the dead money report, it's like I'm going to do those every time we have a stock that goes flat, maybe sometimes even more. And the reason is because every time a stock goes flat, my e my inbox fills up. I I'm going to keep talking about following your plan because every time a stock triggers, almost religiously, okay, in the service, somebody either takes a trade, obviously, or doesn't take the trade. If they take the trade and the next day they're underwater, I get an email. Hey, Dave, what should I do? It's, it's, uh, it's one day in the trade. It's down. Market went up, stock's down. What do I do? Well, if the stop is not hit, don't do anything. That's why I have to preach all the time. And then the other side of it, follow the plan, is, uh, hey, Dave, I didn't take the trade, and now it's up five points. What do I do? Well, now you're faced with all these other decisions, and now i got to try to figure out what you should do. It's like, you know what, let's go back to the start and just follow the original plan from now on. Uh, a couple of announcements. I'm still working on a beginner's course. It's about a year and a half on this thing. It's amazing how long it's, uh, you know, my wife's like, what are you doing in there? You know, it's like, geez, it's taking forever. But I'm excited about it. And the reason I say and come back to the beginning is once I got into the course fairly quickly, I discovered, one, it would take longer than I thought because I found myself going back in time, imagining myself going back in time, talking to that young punk version of me and telling him what he needs to know. And I think it's going to be, it's like, I know it's a little egotistical to say it's going to be my masterpiece, but I think it's going to be my finest work I've done so far. At least I think that's safe to say. In that I think that if you were a much seasoned trader and you hit a rough spot or you find yourself not following the plan or doing something stupid, go back to the beginning and that's where the answers are going to be and following the plan, and putting the stop in, and taking the profits, and the proper stock selection, okay, as opposed to over-trading, and leveraging up, and doing all these things that you know you should be doing, sometimes going back to the beginning. What amazes me also is the longer I've been in this business, the more I have kind of peeled away 
all the layers and just going back to the assets. Is the price going up? Is it going down? Is it going sideways? Does the stock trade cleanly? Does it tend to persist? In other words, does it tend to go up day after day after day? And all these points are just driven home in this course, and I'm very excited about it. So keep an eye out for that. And I'll, what I'll do, uh, I'm not sure how much I'm going to make free, but I'll make a lot of it free so you can get a good, uh, good taste of it. Uh, do make sure that you're at least on the delayed service. Now, I did, uh, I went through the records on the delayed, and um, I saw that there were quite a few people that were on for over a year, and I was looking at the number of people, and uh, there is a cost of having a bunch of free people in the system. So I decided to, and this is something that I said early on, subject to availability, so I did have to uh, cut some people off. And, you know, good traders, and I hate to be tough love here, but good traders make quick decisions. If you can't decide whether or not you want the service after looking at it for a year, then maybe you need to rethink this trading thing. Now, not to be a jerk, but if you are, if you're broke and can't afford the trade, just shoot me an email and say, hey, Dave, can you keep me on, or is it okay if I log back in or, or sign back up? Uh, then absolutely, you know, feel free to do that. But if you're looking for it, if you're going to getting started on my website and then you come down to step number nine, start following along. So click on this and get under delayed service. And as I say quite often, somebody a while back emailed me. They went live because they were doing well on a delayed service. So that was kind of exciting. So make sure you get on that. Uh, and you can stay on it for about a year or so. How's that? Have you, or until the, the room fills up again. Uh, shoot me an email if you have any questions, anything you want me to cover, and then you obviously check my website out for the free stuff. Now, let's hop into the markets, and let's take a look at, you know what I haven't done in a while? Let's take a look at these major MIGs, these Morningstar industry groups. That would be kind of cool to look at. Now, there's a few other symbols in here too, but let's just take a look at the MIGs first. These major MIGs, meaning the overall industry, there's chemicals, energies, metals, and mining. You can see all these areas are at brand new highs. And if you go within the metals, steel, copper, aluminum, industrial metals and minerals, all are at or near new highs. Gold and silver continue to lag within them. Those aren't the major MIGs. Let's go back to the major MIGs, okay? Conglomerates, not so hot, but those are small areas. But automotive, new highs. Food's not so hot. Tobacco, not so hot. Banking, bam, winning. Banking is starting to act like the dot-coms of 1999, okay? Financials, banging on new highs. Now, these financials, let's take a look at, I think it's XLF. Uh, these financials have a lot of mutual funds in here, so it's not really a true representation. I mean, it's, it's always something to worry about. It's always more complex than it seems. But if you take a look at like XLF, which is pure financials, you can see stalled out a little in here, but then they accelerated right back higher. So financials are doing really well. Uh, insurance, that could be considered some of the financial. Banging out new highs in here. Uh, real estate, eh, not so hot, but interest rates have been on the rise. Drugs, not so hot. Health services overall, not so hot. There's, there are some pockets of strength within those areas, though. Defense, bam, winning. Manufacturing, winning. Materials and construction, if you're going to build a wall, you're going to need some materials and some construction, right? Leisure, bam, winning up here towards new highs. Media, hovering around old highs. Retail, looked like it was left for dead not that long ago, has now come back with a vengeance. I'm not a huge fan of recoveries at these high levels like this, but if it starts making new highs and stays there, then I'll be pretty excited. So the point is that overall, especially retail, is doing really well in here. Overall, things are doing fairly well. Diversified services. Take a look at the trannies. Bam, accelerating to all-time highs. Uh, Dow theorists should be very happy with that. Google it. It's a. It's been around forever. You use the transports as a confirmation. And the reason used to be, at least, that if the economy was doing well, you had to move the goods around. And, and you know, it's kind of interesting. People said, well, that no longer makes sense. But guess what? How many times has UPS or FedEx been in your house lately, especially with Christmas happening, okay? It's almost an everyday occurrence over here. So that's why transports are probably doing so well now. They're moving all those goods around. 
that two-hour delivery thing, right? Uh, computer software kind of sideways, but not too far from all-time highs. Semiconductors, I was a little worried about the semis because they almost pulled back into the prior breakout in here, but now they're coming back with a vengeance. So this, is, this has to be excited because it was this new economy thing, and that's where we were, we were transitioning over to, this new economy thing in the portfolio. But then some of the old economy and some of the more speculative issues like the IPOs, as you can see, we have some in the, in the portfolio, our biotech or biotech IPOs are all beginning to do really well once again. So the rally is broadening out, and that's pretty exciting. Now, getting back to the hypodermic needles, it's like I never thought I would want to trade banks. But, hey, you know what? They're acting like dot-coms, so I'm looking to get long the banks right now. Probably won't be as exciting as biotech or IPOs, but it might be worthwhile. Internet's not doing so hot, but it's coming back, okay? But it's sideways at best. And utilities, obviously, with the interest rates headed higher in general, okay? How about technologies? Technology is doing, doing pretty good. Take a look at the NASDAQ. Bam, look at the NASDAQ all-time highs, right? So NASDAQ, fairly representation, representative of technology. Give me a technology ETF. XLT, maybe? XL, anybody know what that is? Let's see. Uh, XLK. Thank you, Susan. Is this the Susan that has the dreams, or is this another Susan? Yeah, look at XLK. Break it out to all-time highs here, or nearly all-time highs. Let's see. Take a look at a monthly, maybe. Quarterly, there you go. Well, not quite, you know, not quite all-time highs. 99 was all-time highs, but hey. Close enough for government work. So, yeah, technology is making this big comeback in here. And just a few days ago, at least basis this index, it was beginning to look a little iffy. The moving averages were beginning to turn down a little bit. It was looking a little questionable. It bow tied back here, made one little last push higher, began to implode. But now we're seeing this rally broaden out again. Now, let's get to the indices before I forget. If you take a look at the... How many times I have to tell you? Every Thursday I do a show. Margin call. No, it's not a margin call. <laughs> but if you do get one, don't answer it. Okay, uh, SP 500 had the mother of all winning days yesterday. Kind of a little flat today. But sometimes you get that big pop in a pause day. And I've seen somebody try to make a system off of that. I don't necessarily recommend you would trade that. Although, again, I've seen it. It's just too short-term of a thing, too dangerous of a thing to do. But it is a reoccurring pattern that sometimes you'll see, is that the market is the mother of all up days. It could be a down day, too. And then you have a pause day, and then you have another big up day again. It's probably a, a baby with a poopy diaper, uh, just got it changed or something. I don't know. There's probably a candle pattern that tells you why this happens. There's a candle pattern. There's a candle pattern that tells you why everything happens, no matter what happens. Um, but I digress. Anyway, but sometimes you get that pause there in between. So maybe that's what's happening now. Okay. <laughs> Bill collectors don't care about no sneaking show. <laughs> Oh, man, these kids, if they don't, if, if they got their hands out. So, uh, yeah, it might be a bill collector soon, huh, with these cheering. All right, uh, SP 500 up here at new highs. So far, so good. Um, as I often say, sometimes a market will break out. It'll come back to kiss that base goodbye and then take off again. And that's exactly what the S&Ps did. So that's a good thing. Now, if you take a look at the NASDAQ, a little bit different situation. But it did something interesting, and this is what we were talking about quite a bit in the service, and maybe the market in a minute too probably, is that when you have a market that breaks out, it comes right back into its range, there's two questions you have to ask yourself. How far has it pulled back into the range, and is it continuing to pull back or, or bona fide sell off further into that range? And how long has it pulled back into that range? Remember... In markets, there's this equilibrium, disequilibrium, equilibrium, disequilibrium that happens. If a market drops right back into a range, a lot of people say, oh, geez, as we say in Fargo, and they, they tend to think, well, it's back into a range. I better get out. 
So that shakes those people out, provided, of course, it turns right back up and starts to rally. Obviously, if it continues to drop into that range, then more and more people begin to get hurt. And if you back the chart out a little bit, if you drop well below the range, kind of like we did back here in 2015, anybody remember how much we were shorting back here? Like crazy, right? Then anybody who bought during this range might be looking to get back out at break even. And it took a long time to get back above that range, obviously. So the same thing could happen now. Let's hope it does it. If we drop below the range, it's just human nature for people to look to get out when it bounces back into that range. That's overhead supply. So that would be an extreme example. But in this particular case, the NASDAQ dropped hard, fairly hard. Okay, and this is why you don't want to bail out every time it looks a little scary because it's always going to look a little scary or nearly always look a little scary. And then it came right back up. So, so far it's a do over. If we close somewhere up here, um, then we would be at all time highs for the NASDAQ and it certainly would be a good thing. Uh, Gary wants to take a look. Okay, yeah, let's go ahead and open up to individual stocks. Gary wants me to take a look at the NASDAQ 100. NASDAQ 100 is not quite as impressive and we've got time today. So let's let's figure out why that is. Now I'm not a huge fan of Nasdaq 100. I don't know why we got 105 in here, but let's do this. Let's let's take a look at the Qs, okay? And let's take a look at the Qs. Uh, let's go back to November, okay? Uh, since November, the Qs are up two percent. They're all over the place, right? Electrocardiogram. And let's see what's going on by looking at this, okay? So we've got some stocks in here that aren't doing so hot. And these are the stocks that are weighting down the NASDAQ. And one of them, of course, is Facebook. And the NASDAQ 100 is a weighted index, okay? So stocks that have big cap capitalization like Facebook are going to have a bigger weight on the index. And a while back, and I don't know where it is now, but... Apple Computer, which I see down here, hasn't done much since uh, November, is pretty much flat. Okay, so Apple Computer at one time was 20% of the NASDAQ. We'll take a look at Am uh, where's Amazon. Oh, Yahoo's in here. Yahoo is actually down. Okay, so that's weighting it down. So I'm not a huge fan of this index, unless, of course, it's going higher. Amazon not doing so good in here. That's a big, huge stock, obviously. Okay. So you can see a lot of stocks are dragging down this index, and a lot of these big cap stocks in here aren't doing that well. So yes, the, the, the NASDAQ does not confirm what's happening in the overall market. At least, I'm sorry, the, uh, the NASDAQ 100, okay? But it's doing okay. It's coming back. But yes, draw your sideways line, draw your sideways arrow. And until unless it breaks out, you certainly don't want to be trading the, the Qs, okay? But that doesn't mean that there aren't other areas, like, for instance, some of these commodity-related areas that were long, okay, since February that are doing okay. All right, look at that, 158% move. And I think we caught about 140% of that, knock on wood, so far. So it doesn't mean that stocks are doing bad just because the NASDAQ's not doing well, okay? But, yeah, I hear you, Gary. I hear you. Gary's throwing a little uh, wet blanket on things. No, it's fine. Okay, uh, let's open it up for individual stocks. And I'll be happy to take a look at those. In the meantime, let me just take a look at gold, because somebody's going to want to know. Gold is not doing that well. Now, I'm getting emails from people saying, hey, Dave, it's a big picture retracement. And yes, it is. I'm not a huge fan of big picture retracements, except I will make an exception. Sometimes in IPOs, and this is uh, one from a while back, but sometimes in IPOs where the stock is brand new, you'll get these nice big deep retracements. And let's just take a look at this one. This was in the service a while back. Yeah, see, so you got a nice deep retracement fairly early on in the process. And then again, these huge big picture retracements, not a huge fan of them. But as you can see, it came down, hit this retracement level a couple times before taking off again. So they can actually work. Again, I'm just not a huge fan of trading them. So I'm more inclined 
as you can see in the here to draw the blue arrow underneath, and I guess in this case cyan, then I am to say, okay, we had a nice run in 2016 in gold. Now we retrace whatever percent that is, I guess 618. Now it's time to go long again. No, that's not how I want to trade. Unless, you know, maybe I'll make a rare exception in IPOs, okay? But other than that, I look at the trend of the market, okay? Where was it a month ago, two months ago, three months ago, four months ago, five months ago? So gold is headed lower since July. Now, am I shorting it? No. And the reason I'm not shorting it is because, uh, to me, it looks like it's just going to come down here and test its, its 2016 lows, or 2015 lows, I should say. So from there to there, that's not that exciting. Now, what I shorted, let's take a look at like a weekly chart, okay? I would be more inclined to short gold if it's coming off of like a bow tie here on the weekly, okay? That's a little bit more exciting as opposed to going down to hit 10, 15-year lows or whatever that is down here. All right, stocks are coming in nicely. Let's take a look at oil real quick before I forget, and then we'll uh, we'll get to your stocks. Keep them coming. We should have plenty of time to get to everything today. Oil has just been kind of bouncing around. It's so funny. The media gets so excited about, oh, oil's going higher, oil's going higher. Well, to me, it looks like it's just at a range. In fact, to, to you too, right? So uh, let's not get too excited about oil, but the energy stocks so far are leading the way higher, and sometimes the, the dog wags the tail or the tail wags the dog, however you want to look at it, and sometimes the energy stocks do really well in spite of oil, and sometimes vice versa. Oil does well, and energy stocks aren't doing so hot. So if you're using USO as a proxy, I wouldn't get too excited about the oils until they got, the oil itself, I should say, until they got above 12. Now, it doesn't mean there's not opportunities in the energy stocks, and they're mostly going higher. As we uh, saw in a minute ago, energy is that new multi-year highs. So I'm okay with uh, the individual stocks, and oil's okay because it's recently rallied up towards the top of its range, but ideally I like to see it break up and keep on going. Andre wants to know about NAK. NAK I like. That was one I had on my Landry list not that long ago, uh, but it's squirrely. It's a crazy one, okay? Uh, HV is 122. Uh, maybe in the next pullback, but it's a really crazy stock. So consider yourself warned on that one. But yeah, it's certainly uh, headed higher, Andre. Good eye on that. HOV, that's going to be a home builder, I believe. Havanarian. Yeah, that looks kind of interesting. A uh, bit of a knockout move today. So I'll give you a thumbs up on that one. Let's back the chart out. Yeah, you got some issues back here, but I think that's a, uh, I think you're okay with that. And I like the, I like the big thrust higher here. Um, ideally, I would have liked to see an even more of a knockout move in this one. But absolutely, that's a good eye on that one because you've got a nice trend and a knockout move. And let's see, you're coming off of fairly low levels. So remember a minute ago I said I'd much rather trade, you know, goals when they're way up here. Well, I'd rush, much rather trade a stock when it's like way down here, make it a big transition higher. So, yeah, that one needs to go on your, uh, definitely go on your watch list for sure. Daddy like, Air G. And if we can't find anything better, I'll give you a high five later on on that one. This is another one of those deep retracements. This is one we were long and we got stopped out of not too long ago. But it's another case of that deep retracement. I did talk about this a little bit in the IPO course as a pattern to be recognized, but not necessarily traded. But it's pretty cool. I mean, one, one day, it takes me a long time to embrace and accept a new pattern. And I think it should you too. I mean, it's, I remember years ago, this friend of mine uh, who, who trades, I, I stopped short of calling him a trader, he trades. Uh, he's like, hey, I'm, I'm doing this counting pattern and, and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, hey, that's really neat. Uh, when did you uh, when did you learn how to do that? How long have you been doing that? He's like, uh, he goes, oh, I, I just read it about an hour ago. And he already had on open trades. It's like, no, that's not how you should trade. You should do years and years of empirical research before you actually go out and start doing these things. But you can see that was a deep retracement, and this was also a deep retracement here uh, in this one. Um, I would not go long or short this stock just because I don't really have a pattern that I trade, okay? So we got stopped out, so be it. We got stopped out of the profit, so that's better than poking the eye. But I would leave that one alone. Fang, F-A-N-G. Phil, you're next. Um, this is one I, I watch on and off, but it's a little bit, uh, 
it's a little bit all over the place. I think you could possibly find something a little cleaner in the energies. And it did pull back to where it broke out from. So I think I would leave this one alone. Uh, it has a bit of an electrocardiogram aspect to it. So I think you could possibly find something cleaner. Let's see, independent oil and gas. Let's just take a jump over there real quick. We got time today. Um, change watch list to sub industry components. Let's see. Volume. So let's sort them by the 90 day volume just so we get the big caps on top. So remember that thing was kind of all over the place. So you can see there's some of, at least this one a little bit. Let's find you something cleaner. There's going to be something a little cleaner than that in here, or it should be. This is independence. Maybe we need to go into all services to find something a little better. See, like that's kind of interesting. It's trending nicely higher, maybe on a pullback. That was PDCE for those who keep it school. Let's see if we can find something. Yeah, these are a little choppy. I'll give you that. So maybe, uh, maybe there's nothing better within that. Maybe we go to energies overall. Let's go to energies overall. Change watch list to industry components. Okay, there's going to be some big fat ones on top. But as we drill down, look, there was one that was kind of trending a little bit better. See, even, even a Chevron, see what I'm saying? Even a Chevron is trending better than the Fang, okay? And as we go a little further down with the list, that was one that was breaking out. We should be able to find something a little cleaner. Look, like that, okay? What's that, BHI? You know, if you had to be in an energy, that looks a little bit better or a lot bit better than that fang, which is kind of all over the place. So try to find something that trades cleanly. And I know sometimes within the energies, the energies can be uh, choppy because of the underlying commodity. But, yeah, dig a little deeper, and you should be able to find something that trades a little cleaner than that if you feel like you have to have an energy stock. Here's one breaking out, HFC. There you go. What's that? Well, I prefer if this was more than just one day, but obviously this is a lot cleaner than the Fang PDCE going up to new highs. So you get the idea. All right, uh, Ellen. Oh, I said Phil was next. Phil says IPI like HOV got in. At 130, now we'll add on pullback. IPI. Oh, you got in 130? Wow. Yeah, IPI. It's it's something I was looking at just yesterday. Um, it took off like a banshee, and unfortunately, it was just like a big one day up. But I'm going to keep an eye on this one to see how it shakes out. Uh, I would I wouldn't trade this stock if I was just seeing this because it just looks a little bit too extreme 100% of the day, and I call out a bottle rocket if those of you, for those of you who had the stock course, but if you look at this thing longer term, this could be the start of something much bigger. Now it's going to be hard for me to hop on with the extreme move that it just made, but it has caught my eye, and you don't have any real resistance in this thing until you get into the double digits. So. This could be what I often call the Phoenix pattern, where they just come down and bottom out forever. And and this is, uh, it reminds me of what Dick Fruth uh, calls, uh, I think he calls it the tombstone pattern or something. But what happens is the, um, it, it a lot of people get washed out of the market. People die, unfortunately. People uh, inherit the stock and then dump it. Uh, people give up on the stock while it goes sideways. So, and then sometimes the stock actually gets its act together or the economy changes or you got a president comes in and says he's going to make America great again. And then all of a sudden these stocks become reborn, hence the Phoenix pattern. OK, and Dick Fruits, his arguments uh, are a lot more carefully thought and fundamentally based as to why this happens. And, and um, check out his book uh, if you get a chance, Parabolic uh, Something parabolic. You can find it on Amazon. So I'll give. I'll throw out a, a plug to him. He's a good guy. It's worth reading. LNC for Donald. LNC. LNC. Yeah, it's a little extended in here. This is where uh, these stocks like this that are becoming a little extended are going to have to have the mother of all knockout moves for me to get excited about them. 
but I hear you. Dave about AMD at six, now about ten. How do you set a sell stop? All right, Joe, let's take a look at that. AMD at six. Well, you have to give it some room. And there's a few things to look at. Uh, and let me see if I, I might actually have a presentation. Let's see if I can find it. So whenever you get into a stock, you've got to ask yourself, um, you know, where would you be wrong, okay? For instance, let's say that, let's see if I can do this on the fly. So when you get into a stock, you've got to ask yourself, where would you be wrong? So if a stock breaks out of a base and comes all the way back in, then you're what? Wrong. <laughs> and if a stock, if you're trading like a first thrust off of like major lows and it comes back down close to those old lows, okay, where would you be wrong? Wrong. Okay, you get the idea. Now, it gets a little bit trickier when you're trading something like a pullback because how do you know when it's a bona fide reversal or just a major correction? And the answer is you don't know where you're going to be wrong, okay? So the wrong becomes wrong, hmm? <laughs> okay? That was a little, uh, that was a little teaser for my, for my introduction course. See, I don't take myself too seriously, and I hope you should, you don't take me too seriously either. Um, so where would you be wrong? Well, if it comes back to this prior little double top knockout type of looking pattern in here, you would obviously be wrong. And if you're long from six and you're already taking partial profits, then I would give it plenty of breathing room. Okay. Maybe just have a stop somewhere in here around, let's say 850 or so. Cause if it comes back to 850, then maybe just maybe the, the rally is done and it's failed and then maybe trail it higher from there. So if it goes up another point, maybe bump this up another half a point, and then eventually your stop will probably be towards the top of this base in here, okay? Now, you need to reach a point before you start making trades, and I'm, I'm not beating you up, I'm just gonna make an example here, teachable moment. But you need to make a point before you ever start making trades where you have a plan in place ahead of time and you should never be in a trade and then wonder, geez, where should I place my stop? I know we all have to start somewhere, and if, if, if they weren't uh, people who weren't newer to trading, then I wouldn't probably have an education business, okay? But make sure you make a plan ahead of time, and then with the trailing stop, you want to gradually loosen that up to where you're going to give up some open profits, but hopefully not all of them. And as I often say, you know, my litmus test for that is how much is enough with the open profits? Well, when you reach a point where you're like, you find yourself saying, ouch, that's probably going to hurt. That's going to hurt if I get stopped out. That's probably enough. So this is what, if you feel like this little old lady here and you're looking at your, your computer and you're like, oh, shit, that's going to suck. Well, your stop is probably loose enough, okay? Now, as I often preach, you don't want to mentally monetize those profits because that'll get you out of the trade early, but it's just something to look at, okay? All right, uh, Jim wants to know, AMD was in a DTKO a few days ago. Uh, a little bit, okay? The knockout was not uh, sufficient enough, but it, it was somewhat of a, a double-top knockout, okay? So, so to answer your question, yes. OK. Now, sometimes I seek a little bit too much perfection when it almost to a fault when it comes to to stocks and stock selection. But you can't look at the missed opportunities and beat yourself up. And I know regret is a bigger motivator than than uh, than a loss. OK. So the fear of missing out, that's what I mean by regret. But you have to realize that by not being super selective, 
a lot of times you're going to get into a lot of uh, mediocre stocks. So, yes, was it a double top knockout? Yes. But for me to get excited about it, it would have had to be a bigger knockout move, okay? And you have to be, just be willing to say, well, I'm willing to let it go, okay? And trading like life, as I often say, is, uh, is just making decisions and then, of course, living with them. You're welcome, Joe. Okay, GWR, small rail. GWR for Miss Susan. All right. Uh, yeah, kind of thin, uh, but, yeah, it's banging out new highs. It does have a lot of overhead supply. I know it goes way back, uh, but sometimes markets can have very long memory. So I think it would pass based on that. But I hear you. It's making multi-year highs. Uh, on a pullback, I hear you. But I think just because it's got so much resistance longer term, I think I would leave it alone. Don is here, and Don would like to know about F, which has nothing to do with the methodology. <laughs> um, it's all over the place. A big gap down, and then it's down, it's up. It's a Jackie Mason stock. And then you got a ton of overhead supply to deal with. Okay. But I guess if... Um, I guess if Donald Trump brings all the jobs back to the U.S. when we make all the Fords here, then maybe it'll take off, huh? That's why you got to be careful not to confuse the issue with facts and get too excited with these big picture ideas. TGB. Now, there's somebody who's looking at a stock that's moving. Good job on that one. Um, got a lot of overhead supply, but, hey, that's at two. That's 100% away. So if I make 100% in every trade, I'm okay. Uh, it's this move higher has been a bit extreme, so it would have to have a really big deep pullback or a really big mother of all knockout move. Okay, Howard is long S and D. Oh, you want to go long? Yeah, I mean, you know, on a pullback, it looks okay. Um, this was a was an IPO breakout pattern back here. What I call the buy at B. Okay. The market's going to go from A to B to C. It's going to have to pass. It's going to, what, if the market is going to go from A to C, it's got to pass through B along the way, and that's my theory with the IPOs. And it's a it's an awesome little pattern. But yeah, you need a knockout move here. Absolutely, put this on your um, on your radar as a possible stock. I would definitely uh, keep an eye on that one. Long from eleven forty six. Ah, all right. Well, you're you're one step ahead of me then. Good job. The buy was a little bit higher than that, but I hear you. It's got a bit of a flagpole pattern, too. ARCB for Donald. We have a few Donalds in here today and a Don. Uh, it's, I don't like this drifting action, but now it's beginning to accelerate higher a little bit. Wait for the next pullback, and let's see how it shakes out. Yeah, maybe the next pullback. I'm getting emails from people. I'm in I'm in my thing, people. What do you call this thing? We could charge. RP. Um, well, it's not it's it's working its way higher, but not in a very smooth fashion. So you want to see some sort of uh persistency and acceleration higher followed by a pullback. FYI, somebody bought twenty one 211,000 F calls for March with the 15 strike was done yesterday. Somebody knows something, they paid 13 cents for them. 211,000 March 15s for 13 cents. Uh, I got you. Well, I hear you. The only problem with that is how do you know that they're not hedged Somehow, let's say two, one, 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 zero times, what would that be? 13 cents each would be, is that $13? 13 equals, yeah, so that's a couple of million dollars they put. Oh, interesting, but they might be hedged somehow, okay? So you don't know. I mean, it's a complex world. Yeah, it'd be great. Like, oh, man, somebody's buying these calls. Let me ride the to coattails, but be careful with that. Uh, be careful playing that game. Okay, but GPS when it bounced off the 200, I'm up 4% on it. It's weakening today. Hold to take profits. Okay, well, 
and I don't want to beat you guys up too much because you never ask any questions. It, it obviously, this is a big part of the show. But when you get into a trade, you have to ax yourself, as they say in the South, you got to ax, go ax your mama. Uh, you got to ax yourself, ask yourself, where would I, where am I going to get out, okay? Where am I going to take partial profits, et cetera? So this is not one of my trades to uh, take a uh, trade off the 200-day moving average. Uh, so, but that if that is one of your trades, then if you, what's your system say? Does your system say if it gets well below it again, you get out? Uh, so whatever your system says, but this is all over the place. Uh, so it's not, a, it's not something I would take. Uh, but just give it, give it as much room as you think it needs based on your time frame. My exit is going to be a 50-day line. Well, okay, well, if that's your exit, then that's your exit. Okay, let's take a look at the 50-day in this thing. Um, that's fine. You know, it's not my way or highway. It's not my style of trading, but I hear you. So he says the 50-day is his exit. Well, then it's already taken, it's taken out the 50-day now. So then that needs to be your exit. Now, if this was something within my methodology, kind of like the AMD, which kind of sort of fit the methodology, then I could tell you where your stop should be. But if you're following a different system, then it has to be uh, that. That's the key day. You're right. They, they might be hedged. Yeah, that's the thing, you know, and, and it sounds exciting. Wow, they bought 200,000 uh, call options or whatever it is. Uh, but they might already be long some puts, or they might have already sold some at a higher level. And they might just be hedging their bets. They say, oh, well, I've got $10 million worth of profits here, uh, but I can't lock and load right now. What if I put $200,000, or what is it, $2 million, I guess, if I'm doing the math right. What if I put $2 million into these, uh, into these calls, and if the market goes up there, I can end up making uh, – Five million on the calls, and then I can still make my ten million that I had in my other position. If the market drops, then at least I made eight million dollars. I mean, it's it's a complex world, and that's the only problem when when you start watching these things like these options activity. And now, if that's all you do is watch options activity, and I know some people that do that, or know of people that do that then that's fine, and you get a feel for it, and you have an idea. But just, just as a random throwing it out there like, oh, somebody bought 200,000 calls, well, what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything, okay? It could mean something, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you can jump in and trade it. Uh, Jeff wants to know about F-O-S-L. F-O-S-L. Uh, no, this is all over the place, okay? Uh, you get big gap down, and now it's coming up, and pull back. So I wouldn't be a big fan of this one at this juncture. It would have to have a pretty serious rally. So I'd leave that one alone. TMST for one of the Donalds. We have a lot of Donalds. We always have a lot of Donalds in here. I think everybody just defaults their name to Donald for some reason. Yeah, this could be worthwhile on a pullback. A little overhead resistance way back in 2015. Pullback or a knockout? Look at that persistent move, okay? To those of you who are new to the show or newer to the show, this is what a stock should look like. It should persist higher, meaning it goes higher day after day after day after day after day. It can occasionally correct. Nothing wrong with that. But when it corrects, it tends to go right back up. So, yeah, put that on your radar. Absolutely. Good eye on that. Donald. STLD. That's going to be another one of those metals in mining. Yeah, I mean, there, there you go again, Donald. Good job. Good job. That needs to be in your momentum list, okay? Popped off with a gap, and then, or took off with a gap, I should say. Nicely higher. Not quite a big enough knockout move for me. Hey, I can live with that, no problem. But yeah, on a pullback or a knockout, absolutely. Susan says, WNR, another refiner like HFC. I'm not a huge fan of the refiners because their business is kind of opposite of oil, and it makes my brain hurt. Uh, oil is actually a cost of goods for them, cost of goods sold. There goes my MBA rearing its ugly head. Uh, tons and tons and tons of overhead supply, Susan. That's my big problem there. Let's just throw it out based on that. I, I, V, I. All right. Um, this one looked interesting to me. I wanted to see a little bit more knockout move, and now it's kind of working its way back higher. 
for me to get excited about it, it would actually have to correct more than it did recently. And again, so maybe I'm looking for too much perfection. But for me to go after this one now, I'd have to make new highs and then correct again. Okay. I, 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 N. Uh, well, it's thin. It's super duper thin. Where's my average volume? It's missing. i got to get that set up on this computer. And I don't like the fact that it had a big gap down and then it went straight back up. I mean, you know, here's the deal. Let's take a look at steel and iron stocks. If we jump to the sub industry, this is what steel and iron stocks looks like overall, okay? So you don't want to be in a stock that's just kind of all over the place like this when the overall sector, if I can get back to it, well, you get the idea, is in such a great trend. EDIT for Rick, yeah, that's one that we were trying to get long. And uh, let's see if we can find it again. Okay. And it, it no longer fit the methodology because it had too many days in the pullback, but it still looks like the mother of all bottoms. So this is something that I would definitely put on your radar. And one thing I like about it is that sometimes these IPOs can make that Phoenix pattern. This is something that I talked a lot about in the course, not to soft sell it, but uh, I talked a lot about it in the course, which was on sale last week, by the way. So if you're interested in that, let me know, and I'll see if I could uh, turn that on for you. But sometimes in these IPOs, you have like a kind of a microcosm of that Phoenix pattern. They, they take off or they just flat out die, and then they get their act together, then they're going to take off again. So definitely keep this stock on your radar, and let's wait and see if we get a new setup here at some point. So good eye on that as far as something needs to be on your radar. But now for me to get excited about it, I know Phil's probably already in it, uh, the way he trades sometimes. You, was, you mentioned it to me a few days ago, right? Uh, but I would actually wait for a breakout and then possibly a pullback. First pullback after a base breakout is what I would look for there. TMST? Steve, you're next. Yeah, we already we're did that one. Yeah, good eye on that one again. Uh, Steve wants to know about RP. And Arsene is next. Arsene is next. Uh, uh, yeah, we talked about this one. It needs to be more, um, sorry about that. I need to get straight here. This is why I have to delete him after I talk about him. Uh, Arsene wants to know about FMCC. FMCC. And Gary, you're next. Uh, it's not coming up. FMCC, FMCC. Uh, it's not coming up in this uh, thing. Rick wants to know about AG. That's going to be a silver stock. Um, well, right now, silver itself is not looking so hot. But that's okay because maybe it's going to bottom out in here somewhere between 14 and 15 based on the SL, SLB shares, okay? And... Maybe something like AG might be the early in the early phases of bottoming out first. I would much prefer a silver stock coming off of major, major lows like this. But not not a bad eye on that one at all. But I'd like I prefer it over major lows. Not quite uh, set up. Let's see if there's a bow tie in there. Sort of. Yeah, it is a bow tie. So I hear you. Uh, technically, yes, it's a go, but I'd prefer it if it was coming off of more major lows. And I don't see any reason to uh, fight uh, silver yet, fight the longer-term downtrend in silver yet, if you need an excuse not to take it. Phil's long at it. <laughs> I knew you would be. Uh, Phil's on my trading service, and he does things a little bit differently than me. Uh, but I don't have a problem with what he does because it's conceptually correct. Yeah, I don't have uh, pink sheets on this computer. N-O or N N O or N-G. I wish there was a way to make this font bigger. I wish I could put on the Ellie font because that's the big font. Uh, let's see. What is it? KM, this one? Yeah. Yeah, this looks interesting, but obviously uh, it needs what? A pullback, okay? So pullback or like if you have the mother of all knockout moves, that would be great for that one. So good eye on that. HRS for Dennis on a pullback. Hey, Dennis. Good to see you. Um, no, and the reason is because it, it just it didn't pull back enough here. 
Well, okay, here's a caveat. Maybe if it makes a double top knockout kind of move, okay? But it does have quite a few days in here, so I'll know it when I see it. But if it pops down to 100, maybe, okay? Maybe. I'll give it a maybe on that. But that's one of those things where we're going to have to wait a few days and see if it actually does that first. So, yeah, possibly possibly on a pullback, okay? I'm also long AG. <laughs> Uh, TGB for Andre, TGB. Uh, yeah, this is pretty interesting. Um, it's a it's a low price stock, penny stock, not a penny stock, but under a dollar. Uh, yeah, we talked about this one. Lots of overhead supply at two, but who cares? Yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. Uh, C R N T. You know the Andre pick? Uh, no. No, I mean, it's just uh, too much of an electrocardiogram shorter term. It would have to break out and pull back for me to get excited about it. SFBY. SFBY. Oops. I must have left. Oh, I, I deleted on accident. Can you put type that one back in? In the meantime, we'll do CWST, CWST, and then Dennis will go back to you. Uh, yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. That looks pretty interesting. And it's what? Material construction. The only thing that kind of jumps out at me is the volume looks a little thin for an established issue. So very thin. I probably, you probably, um, I mean, I'd be very careful trading that. TTC on a cup and handle. TTC, cup and handle pullback. Yeah, I'm not seeing the cup and handle. Uh, maybe on a pullback. We'll see. Yeah, it's trending. Put it on your watch list, but it's not ready right now. We talk about Kim. Rick left. I guess we can talk about him now. Yeah, and a pullback. I think we talked about that one. CNX for Rick in case he watches the uh, recording. Uh, no, Rick. Uh, this looks like it could actually be in a little bit of trouble. Uh, I wouldn't short it because I wouldn't fight aluminium just yet. But you can see it's got a tiny bit of this little uh, stalling out pattern. I think I would leave it alone is what I would do. And I don't want to use the word hope, but would well not hope. But if it, if it went on to make new highs and then pull back, yeah, absolutely. Because it's still coming off of major lows. All right, Gary says SFTBY. SFTBY. No, I don't have that one either, Gary. I don't know what's going on. You're welcome, Dennis. Anytime, buddy. MDR, it's going to be McDermott, which is oil-related, I believe. Heavy construction. Hey, man, if you're going to build the wall, you're going to need some heavy construction. Yeah, absolutely, but on a pullback, okay? And see, this is a good example of how stocks' personalities can change. It was wide and loose. It was chopalotagus throughout here, and now it's beginning to trend nicely and persist higher. So it doesn't mean that it won't always be a bad stock to trade, a good stock to trade, or a bad stock to trade, however you want to look at it. Uh, maybe on a pullback. It's got some bad memories way back here, but it's that's a ways away. It doesn't look like a whole lot. P E I X P E I X and we're getting to the lightning round so we'll have to speed it up a little bit. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. These uh chemicals are are doing doing really well in here, especially especially chemicals. I'll say that three times fast. Let's jump to the watch list. I said I would slow it I'm speed it up and I've got Yeah, you can see let's see if there's anything interesting that was breaking out. So if you look at these specialty chemicals, this looks kind of interesting here. WLK, a little bit on the thin side, though. I need to get my average volume back in. I mean, look at this one. See, you know, in a knockout move, the next knockout move, that might be worthwhile. That was CC, I believe, for those keeping score. So, yeah, we could see some stuff in these specialty chemicals uh, soon. NGVT. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, you just said that. NGVT, absolutely. Yeah, look at that. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I need to get my average volume up here on this one. Oh, there it is, right there. Duh. It's a different color on the computer. Yeah, this looks okay. Um, you know, a little bit more pullback would have been nice, but it would have put it back to here. Uh, it looks okay, especially since it's a fairly new issue. Yeah, I'll give you an okay on that one. Absolutely. Okay, any more? we got time for a few more. While we're in impasse, let me thank everybody for taking time on your busy schedule to be here. As usual, I appreciate it. Okay, going once. 
going twice. Okay, anything unanswered? Oh, you always get one at the last minute. A dollar. Let's take a look at a dollar. Um, dollar looks like it's headed higher uh, because it had a nice run in here. Okay. And it, it looks pretty good. Uh, I wouldn't rush out and buy it, at least not through the dollar index itself. But yeah, maybe within Forex, there might be something to do there. MSCC for Don, you're welcome. Okay. We have time for one more if you have. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe on a pullback. Okay, you had a little bit of a TKO move here. That's kind of triggering. Um, again, I'm looking for a little bit more perfection, maybe a little deeper TKO. But, hey, I can't argue with the fact that it's making new highs. So maybe on the next pullback. You're welcome, Andre. And last one. Uh, we cannot talk about that one, Jim, because that is a setup for today uh, in a trading service. So we can't talk about that one. But absolutely uh, put all your money into that one. No, I'm kidding, obviously. <laughs> uh, but 2% of the portfolio on a trigger might not be a bad thing. But, yeah, good eye on that one, Jim. <laughs> yeah, tell everyone. Go shout it from the rooftop. Once it triggers, though, let it trigger first before you do that. Uh, then you will buy. Yeah, yeah, uh, Jim. Yeah, wait for wait for the official entry. Okay. But yeah, great eye on that one. Uh, I'll, I'll make a note of that next week. I'll bring it up and I'll tell everybody what it was, and we'll see if it worked or if it did. Good, bad, or indifferent. Okay. You buying the beer? Fantastic. All right, Jim. I knew I like you a lot. Uh, in addition to being a client, I, I, <laughs> I like that a lot about you. All right, well, look, uh, I need to wrap things up here because they get a little long and hard to process. So, But I love doing these shows, as you can tell. It's a highlight of my week, and, and obviously without you, there's no show. So thanks for showing up. I appreciate that. Anything unanswered, daviddavelander.com. Uh, do me a favor if you don't mind. It just helps me to keep this content rolling. Uh, click on it on YouTube if you're really bored and can't sleep at night and watch it, and then like it on YouTube, and that would be just awesome. And if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, please like it. Leave a comment. Uh, it, whether you like it or not, leave a comment. Okay, I'll take. Uh, we'll take all comments, good and bad. Anyway, everybody have a great uh, weekend. If we don't talk again, and again, anything unanswered, DavidDaveLandry.com, and we'll talk again. I guess next Thursday. Thank you so much.